morning. It's my pleasure to introduce Mr. Daniel Rodriguez for his dissertation defense. Daniel is originally from Fresno, California, and after high school spent five years in the Navy as uh, an IT specialist. Um, he joined UCSD as a transfer student, and then uh, I met him in 2013 when he took my class, Nano 103. Then came to uh, my office one time um, and said that uh, I won this uh, prestigious scholarship, the IMSD scholarship, and if, uh, if I could have a position in the lab. And I said, okay, send me an email. And you said, I did. <laughs> 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 and uh, after a short conversation, um, said welcome aboard, and it was a, it's been a really a fantastic um, association for the last five years. So Daniel has been a BS, MS, and PhD student um, in my group. Uh, actually, shortly after starting the PhD program, he won the NSF GRSP fellowship. He has uh, really done a lot of work in that he'll talk about today in not just uh, sort of the, the core areas of molecular and microstructural determinants of the mechanical properties of organic semiconductors, but importantly, um, techniques to measure these properties. Um, that's <coughs> a really important characteristic when we're talking about materials that are only available in milligram quantities and thin films. Um, so in addition to the work that Daniel will be uh, mostly focused on, he's also had a large hand in our new uh, work on materials for haptics, and also uh, was involved in collaboration with MD Anderson, led by his uh, close uh, colleague uh, Julian, to use uh, graphene-based sensors to measure swallowing activity in uh, cancer patients. So Daniel's really been a, uh, a mature, steady presence in the lab. Um, I've really appreciated his uh, uh, all of the leadership that he's shown in the group um, uh, as safety coordinator uh, for a few years, as well as many other responsibilities that he took on that I didn't necessarily ask him to take on. So for that, I'll always be uh, grateful, and I look forward to a great talk. <clears throat> well, uh, thank you, Darren, for that kind introduction, and thank you to my friends and family and members of the committee who have uh, um, come here today to listen to my thesis talk. And so my thesis can be primarily summarized into two different parts. Um, the first part is the discovering, implementing, and um, comparison of different mechanical methods that we can use to test thin film mechanical properties. And the second part is using these mechanical properties to study structure property relationships in organic semiconductors. <coughs> and so the title of my thesis is Techniques for Measuring the Mechanical Properties of Organic Semiconductors. So organic semiconductors are carbon-based semiconductors, and these can either be polymeric materials or small molecules. Um, and one of their primary features and advantages is their molecular tunability. And this means that uh, through synthesis, we can precisely tune the residues that make up the backbone structure, uh, say, for example, in a polymeric material. Um, in addition, we can also tune the side chains that uh, render these materials soluble in organic solvents. So these uh, side chains can be linear alkyl side chains or branched alkyl. Um, they could also be ethylene oxide or other types of side chains. Um, in addition to their uh, side chain structure, we can also create block copolymers, for example, to sort of co-optimize properties from two different types of polymeric materials, um, as well as vary their molecular weight and their dispersity. And together, these, um, the tuning of these structures can render properties such as mechanical flexibility. And so mechanical flexibility will enable things like roll-to-roll -roll processing, which is large area and low-cost fabrication techniques uh, that we can use to print solar cells by the yard. Um, we can also render these materials more durable and compatible um, with, with different types of fabrics so we can create smart textiles um, and electronic textiles. Um, additionally, we can make these materials stretchable and biocompatible so that they can be laminated onto the skin and um, used as wearable sensors and displays, for example, for uh, long-term healthcare monitoring. <coughs> now, what makes organic semiconductors conducting is their pi conjugated uh, backbone. And what that means is that it has this alternation of these single and double bonds along the length of, of the backbone. And this allows the electrons in the pi orbitals of these materials to delocalize across the length of the molecule, and it allows for charge transport. Now to, uh, as I was saying earlier, to make these materials soluble, typically we need to attach these um, aliphatic side chains um, to the backbone core structure. 
And so I'm showing, the example I'm showing here is called P3HD. It's sort of the workhorse material in literature. Um, it's well characterized um, in terms of all, most of its properties. And so when you dissolve this material in a solution such as chloroform or chlorobenzene and cast it into a thin film using spin coating techniques, um, you arrive at one of three typical types of morphologies. The first of which is an amorphous morphology. Now, the, the, an amorphous morphology means that the polymer chains are randomly distributed throughout the polymer film, and there's no long or short range order in these, in these films. Um, you can also have, if you do some sort of post-treatment, so this would be a, like an ASCAS film with no post-treatment. If you were to do some sort of thermo annealing or small amounts of thermo annealing, you can get the film to partially aggregate, where you have um, some degree of short range order in the polymer film, and it's mixed in with the amorphous domains of, of P3HD. Upon further thermo annealing, you can get uh, bigger crystalline behavior in the P3HD, um, and you create longer range order. And typically, these larger crystalline domains are associated with um, <coughs> higher degrees of charge carrier mobility, um, and, so, and so they increase the performance of these materials. And so this is an example of a pure film, and so this material by itself can be used to make an organic field effect transistor, but if you wanted to make something like a solar cell, you need to mix this material with an electron donor, or, or an electron acceptor, rather. And so here's a small molecule electron acceptor. It's the most common one, actually, called PCBM. And it's a fullerene-based acceptor. Um, and when mixed with P3HT, P3HT plays the role of an electron donor. Now, <coughs> when you mix these two materials together in the same solution and cast them into a film, you create what's called, what's known as a bulk heterojunction. Um, and this is a type of solar cell morphology. And this morphology consists of three phases. A PCBM rich phase, which is mainly comprised of crystalline PCBM, a P3HT rich phase, which is mainly crystalline P3HT, um, and a well mixed phase, which is um, PCBM that's well mixed into the amorphous domains of P3HT. And so this is the active layer of a solar cell. This, this is the layer that actually absorbs the light and converts it into charge carriers. Yes. And so if you were to drop contacts on either side of this layer and shine light on this, you can actually create, the photo, create a photovoltaic effect and uh, measure the response. And so organic solar cells work, um, charge carriers are generated um, in the electron donor material, and they're separated at the junctions between these two materials, uh, the electron donor and the electron acceptor. And so in a bulk heterojunction, there's multiple junctions throughout the film. Um, that's actually why it's called a bulk heterojunction. So you have multiple junctions throughout this one film. And so um, when light comes in, you excite an electron from the highest occupied molecular orbital in the donor um, into the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. Um, this, this creates what's called an excite, uh, exciton. This exciton can then diffuse around the crystalline regions of the electron donor until it arrives at an interface um, of, of where it meets the electron acceptor. And due to the energetic difference between these two materials, the voltage created at this junction can actually separate the exciton into an electron and a hole and then the electrons and holes can diffuse to their, or can travel to their respective electrodes, and you create a photovoltaic effect and you complete the circuit. And so to measure the properties of these solar cells, you, um, you typically you construct what's known as a JV curve. And so the power point here at this, or the, the inflection here is known as your max power, or your max power point. And so the voltage at this max power point is VMP, and the current density at this max power point is JMP. And so the theoretical limit of your solar cell is, the, is determined by the open circuit voltage and the short circuit current. And so the areas of these, two, uh, of these two curves, if you were to divide them into each other, you can get what's known as the fill factor. Um, and together with your theoretical uh, limit of your solar cell, your fill factor, and the incident power, which is coming from the light that you're shining on, on your solar cell, you can calculate the, um, the efficiency of the device. Now, through our prior research in the group, we've shown that these materials or these bulk heterojunction mixtures, these solar cells, um, are not equally flexible. Some are more flexible than others. And so, for example, if we were to take P3HT and PCBM, and we were to laminate this bulk heterojunction film onto a glass hemisphere, as shown in this glass tube here, we see that there's cracking around the curved edges of, of the hemisphere. And if we were to stretch this material on a linear actuator at frames of up to 10%, uh, we see that these, there's these perpendicular cracks um, to the axis of perpendicular to the axis of strain. And 10% strain is about the amount of strain that you would induce in your knuckle if you were to slightly bend it. So it's not a lot of strain at all. However, if we were to increase the side chain length in P3HD to create P3OT um, and mix it with PCBM, we can now see that this material 
and survive being laminated to this hemispherical surface. Um, and similarly, if we increase the side chain length even further to n equals 12, this material can now be stretched beyond 10%. And so these two materials are better candidates for flexible and stretchable solar cells um, than P3H2. And so the questions that I wanted to ask during my PhD were what parameters govern these mechanical properties and how do we measure these properties? <clears throat> so the most common method of mechanical testing is known as a tensile test. In a tensile test, you elongate a sample and you measure the force as a function of its cross-sectional area. And you, that allows you to calculate what's known as a stress. Uh, the strain in the material is simply the relative elongation change divided by its original length. And together, these two quantities plotted against each other can create what's known as a stress-strain curve. Now, a stress-strain curve gives you lots of rich mechanical information. Uh, so for example, the slope, uh, this linear region of this, of this curve here is known as the elastic modulus. Um, and it's a, sort of a measure of um, the, the material's resistance to elastic deformation. And upon, upon permanently, so elastic deformation is reversible deformation. However, upon reaching the yield point, which is the point at which the material permanently starts to deform um, or irreversibly deform, uh, you get the yield point. Um, <coughs> the ultimate stress is just the maximum amount of stress that this material can absorb. And the fracture strain is the strain at which the material fails. So if you were to integrate the area under the elastic region, you can get the uh, resilience, which is the measure of the amount of energy the material can absorb per unit volume uh, reversibly or in the elastic region. And if you were to integrate the entire area under the curve, you get the toughness, which is the measure of the amount of energy per unit volume that the material can absorb before it completely ruptures. Now there's three types of uh, typical mechanical or, or stress strain curve behavior that you might observe. Um, the first is brittle where the material, these types of materials um, can accommodate stress uh, elastically up until their point of, of fracture. But there's no plastic deformation, there's no yielding in these types of materials. This might be something like glass. You can also observe ductile behavior, which is where the material can first absorb stress elastically, uh, and then furthermore, they can absorb more stress by plastically, def uh, plastically deforming. This might be something like a plastic bag, and this plastic deformation comes in the form of rearrangement of the polymer chain within the network. And the last type of behavior you might observe is elastic behavior, where you can accommodate large amounts of stress over a large strain range. Um, and this might be something like a rubber band, where you can stretch it reversibly up to 100 or even 200%. And so here's an example of thin films um, being stretched. And so this might be an example of a brittle material. Um, and this is what ductile behavior might look like in a tensile test. So these methods are great for testing the mechanical properties of bulk films, but this method isn't actually amenable to thin film materials. And um, one, that has to do with the fragility of these thin films. So organic semiconductors are typically fabricated on the order of 50 to 500 nanometers. And so they're really thin and really fragile, difficult to manipulate. And as a freestanding film, oftentimes these films will just crumble up upon themselves due to their own van der Waals forces. And so um, in addition to that, synthesis of these materials typically only yields low quantities on the milligram scale. And so to create a bulk sample, we need something like gram scales of these materials, um, which is typically not within the capabilities of, of academic labs. And so we need different types of techniques to test the mechanical properties of these thin film materials. Uh, the first technique, um, collectively we call these materials thermal elastomer methods because thin films are supported by elastomers to extract their mechanical properties. And so the first technique is called mechanical buckling. This was first demonstrated by George Whiteside and Hutchinson um, in 1998 and then later perfected into a metrology technique by Stafford in 2004. And in this method, we uh, laminate thin films onto pre-stained pre elastomeric substrates. Typically, we use PDMS. And <coughs> upon releasing of the strain, we form uh, an instability on the surface known as uh, a buckling instability. And this creates these surface wrinkles on the surface of the thin film. Now, if you know the dimensions of your film, so say, for example, the thickness um, and the wavelength of these buckles, you can relate that back to the elastic modulus of the film. Um, so long as you know the elastic modulus of your substrate and the Poisson's ratios of both, both the film and your substrate. And so this will extract the elastic modulus <coughs> of, of thin film. To extract the yield point, we use a, a different method, which was first demonstrated in our lab by Dr. Adam Prince in 2015, where he showed that by laminating a thin film onto an unstrained elastomer, and then by cyclically and incrementally loading and unloading the film, <coughs> say, for example, from 0 to 1% back to 0, 0 to 5% back to 0. Upon surpassing the yield point, the film will permanently elongate 
And when you release the strain in the elastomers, they create these surface wrinkles on, on, on the surface again. And these wrinkles or buckles can be seen or observed um, in an optical microscope, or they can also be observed by using a laser to diffract uh, through the thickness of the film. And so this will give us the yield point. Uh, there's one more technique that we use um, called crack onset strain, where we laminate thin films to PDMS substrates and we stretch them in, stretch them in increments of 1%. And upon surpassing the, so here's an example of a tube HD film strained to 10% and again strained to 30%. And you can see that there's the onset of these cracks within the film. And so we label this as the crack onset strain. And so these three methods together can be used to roughly, very roughly, estimate the key features of a stress strain curve. And so for example, the mechanical buckling technique will give us the slope of this line here. The yield point will give us the, uh, the point at which this curve or this line ends. And the crack onset strain will give us the strain at which <coughs> the material fails, or at least the first onset of the crack. And so there isn't a film model elastomer method ca that can capture the plastic behavior between the yield point and the crack onset strain. And so to estimate values, very roughly estimate values of toughness, we estimate a constant strain between these two points. So <coughs> in, my f in these first set of studies, I used these film model elastomer methods to characterize uh, mechanical properties in small molecule semiconductors. And so PCBM, which I've already introduced earlier, is the most common acceptor material uh, in, in literature. And <coughs> 60 PCBM, um, the 60 in, in this PCBM molecule refers to the number of carbon atoms in the fullerene cage. And so there's also a structural analog called 70 PCBM, which has 70 carbon atoms in the fullerene cage. Um, <coughs> and due to this, um, so 60 PCBM creates a perfect sphere, but 70 PCBM creates this oval-like shape. Um, and due to this oval-like shape, the, depending on where this uh, solubilizing unit here attaches, you get the presence of different isomers in these materials. And so in this first study, Dr. Savagatsik and myself wanted to test the hypothesis that since 70 PCBM exists as a mixture of isomers, um, this could hinder the crystallization in the material, especially when compared to 60 PCBM, which is highly crystalline, um, and lead to a softer film. Um, in addition, when you synthesize 60 PCBM, you end up with 70 PCBM as a byproduct, and then you actually have to purify it out. Um, so to get 95% pure 60 PCBM, it has an energetic cost of 30 gigajoules per kilogram. And to get something like 99.9% .9 pure 60 PCBM, there's a tripling in the energetic cost, up to 100 gigajoules per kilogram. So by using mixed grades of these materials, we might be able to reduce the crystallization, reduce their elastic modulus, um, and lower the cost associated with making these materials. <coughs> and so the mechanical buckling technique showed that, um, and well, let me mention here that these are mixtures, these are bulk heterojunction mixtures of 60 and 70 PCBM with PPHD. So these are bulk heterojunction films. And we see that the, the films, the most pure films, so 99% pure 70 PCBM on this side, 99% pure 60 PCBM on this side, have the highest tensile modulus. And 60 PCBM has a higher tensile modulus than 70 PCBM. And this is mainly due, again, to the fact that 60 PCBM can readily crystallize, and it, this leads to stiffer films. However, when we use technical grades of the two materials, and so this would be 10% 70 PCBM and 60, and this would be 5% 60 and 70, uh, we see that we lower the tensile modulus even further. And that by using a 50-50 blend of the two materials, we decrease the elastic modulus even further. Now this is due to um, hindered crystallization in the fullerene, but also it's due to, uh, we found that these mixture of isomers and these, mixture, these technical grades also impact the aggregation of the polymer. And so we use the H aggregate model, which takes UV vis absorption spectra and can deconvolute it into its contribution from amorphous regions and aggregated regions. And so we can extract the percent aggregation from the polymer um, out of this, uh, using this method called the H aggregate model. And, <coughs> and we see that the purest films of 60 PCBM have the highest degree of uh, P2HD aggregation, um, but 70 PCBM as a technical grade has the lowest degree of P2HD crystallization. And this is due to the fact that uh, PCBM is miscible in the amorphous domains of P2HD. And so when 60 PCBM crystallizes and expels P2HT away from it, those polymer chains are now more readily available to become part of P2HT crystals. And so uh, for hindered crystalline behavior within PCBM films, um, these molecules can now intercalate in or mix within the amorphous domains of P2HT and that prevents uh, the polymer from aggregating. 
And so we also created photovoltaic um, solar cells out of these materials. And we saw that amazingly, regardless of the mixture, we were able to preserve the electronic performance of these materials, as well as lower their stiffness, lower their embodied energy, which reduces their cost, um, and leads to a less, lesser degree of polymer aggregation. So 70 PCM is the most common acceptor, but um, by itself, this material is really stiff, has an elastic modulus of five, gig five gigapascals, and a really low crack on crit strain of half a percent. So not very amenable for uh, stretchable or flexible electronics. So we wanted to uh, test the mechanical properties of other small molecule semiconductors that are non-fullerene. So for this first molecule here, this is a, an example of a non-fullerene acceptor molecule. Um, that has that can achieve high performances when mixed with PCHP. So a solar cell of up to 3.7 percent, which is on par with any mixture with 70 PCDM. Um, we also tested the some small molecule donor materials, and so here's an example of a high performance small molecule called DPS, um, and when mixed with PCDM, it can create a 7 percent efficient solar cell. Um, this particular molecule also has these branch side chains coming off the core unit and these hexyl side chains coming off the thiazine units here on the end. Um, the last molecule that we studied was SMDPP. Um, this molecule also has these branch side chains that come off the core units and hexyl side chains coming off the end group. Um, but additionally, it has this, the presence of this DPP unit here. Um, which, and this DPP unit is commonly used in low band gas semiconductors, which are typically associated with higher uh, levels of performance due to their absorption um, and the lower energy range of the solar, cell, solar, cell, of the solar spectrum. So we tested the tensile modulus of these materials using the buckling technique. And we found that the, the three molecules that have these side chains that come off the core unit have the lowest tensile modulus, up to five times lower than, than pure PCDM. Um, and similarly, we found that the, these same materials also exhibited the highest degree of stretchability. So up to 15% for this DPS molecule here, 10% um, for SMDPP, and around 5% for HPIBP. And so these three molecules have um, much more stretchability um, than 70 PCDM. And the reason we believe this is occurring is due to the fact that these uh, side chains here are pushing the conjugated cores of the palm, or sorry, of the small molecules apart. And this is leading to lower van der Waals forces or van der Waals cohesion, cohesion between the materials, which leads to a lower elastic modulus and a less uh, or a more stretchable film. So these would be good candidates for stretchable or flexible transistors, uh, but we also wanted to test their mechanical properties as solar cells. And so we mixed each of these molecules with, uh, so these are donors and these are acceptors. We mixed them each together um, and found that the mixtures with HPIBT, which was the small molecule acceptor that has side chains, um, had the lowest tensile modulus, up to four times lower than their mixtures with, with PCDM. And we also found that the same mixtures were the most stretchable up to 10 and 5% respectively um, for their mixtures with HPIBT. And so since we got favorable results for their stretchability, um, we also wanted to test their results as uh, solar cells. And so we fabricated, um, sure. Yes, it's, it's a on deposit on top of elastomer. Yes, yes using PDMA. Um, so when we create the PDMS, we're actually using a curing, we use a curing, um, when we cure the polymers or when we cure the PDMS, we partially, we're partially curing it so that the surface is actually still very sticky. And so when we laminate the thin film, it's to, uh, when we laminate the thin films onto the elastomer, if it's not sticky enough, it won't even come off of the last slide. So it won't even release from the substrate um, that we're stamp transferring it from. So. Yeah, you're right. If the surface isn't sticky enough, then the or it's not adhesive enough, the thin films won't even stick. So we use partially cured PDMS to ensure that there's good adhesion between the thin film and the PDMS. Okay. And so we fabricated uh, solar cell <coughs> devices from these two mixtures, um, each of these small molecules with HPIBT, and 
Although we do see a photovoltaic effect, unfortunately the efficiency was extremely low at 0.03%. And so these are basically unusable solar cells. And the reason that we're getting uh, poor performance from these solar cells might be the same reason that we're getting good spectability. And that's that the, the side chains are, are hindering the aggregation within the films and they're pushing the conjugated cores apart. And so um, this could lead to uh, a disruption or, or degradation of the solar cell performance. And so we moved away from these materials as solar cells and went back to DTS and PCBM, um, which can create a 7% efficient solar cell. But this time we wanted to use additives to try and improve their mechanical properties. And so we chose polystyrene, which is an insulating polymer, and DIO, which is an example of a high boiling point solvent. And we chose these two materials because uh, prior literature showed that by using these two additives, you can, this actually improves the, uh, the solar cell efficiency in these devices. And so DIO creates a solar cell efficiency of 7%, and DIO and polystyrene creates a solar cell of 8%. And so we wanted to test the mechanical properties using these same mixtures and same preparations. And so what we found is that um, the mixtures with polystyrene um, at two different molecular weights were also the most stretchable films, even though they had a really high tensile modulus. And the reason these tensile modulus are really high is because we annealed these films. We thermally annealed them. And the reason we thermally, thermally annealed them is because that's the processing technique that they used, or that's, that was the fabrication technique they used to create this efficiency in the solar cell. So we wanted to test the same parameters um, to test their mechanical properties. And so in this case, we believe that, or I, hypo I hypothesize that the strain is being accommodated by the polystyrene regions and that your charge transport and your solar cell performance is coming from the crystalline regions of your small molecules, uh, DTS and PCBM. And so in this work, we were successfully able to co-optimize both the electronics and the mechanical performance using additives. So thus far, I've been talking about mechanical properties of small molecule semiconductors, but the mechanical properties and the stretchability of these materials are ultimately limited because these are Van der Waals films that are only held together by Van der Waals forces and they don't benefit from things like entanglement um, that a polymer film would. And so in this next study, I compared two different methods of testing the mechanical properties of thin films um, and compared it to uh, use, use a known system. And so these first methods are these film on elastomer methods, which I've already introduced. Um, and the second method is these film on water methods. Um, so this was first demonstrated by um, Kai Chu Kim at KAIS um, in 2013. And, and this method, what they do is they use water as a pseudo substrate to support thin films. And so they chose water because of its high surface tension and low viscosity, uh, which is able to support the thin films. And upon floating these thin films on the water surface, you can attach a load cell um, and a linear actuator using sticky PEMS grips that make Van der Waals contact and adhesion with the thin film. And then you can conduct a pull test and get a full stress strain curve. Now this stress strain curve is considered uh, an accurate measurement of the stress strain behavior, whereas opposed to film on elastomer methods, it's an estimation of a stress strain curve. And so we wanted to compare the two, the results from these two methods. And so we wanted to compare the results using uh, predictable materials. And so we chose P3HP, which is again the model semiconducting polymer material in literature. And we chose this material in a range of molecular weights. Now <coughs> a prior study has shown that as a function of molecular weight, P3HP has an increase in its elongation and an increase in the toughness of these materials. And however, these were done for bulk P3HP tapes. And so what they did is they took large amounts of P3HP and they melt casted it into P3HP tapes that were seven millimeters thick and seven millimeters long and conducted bulk pull tests. And they found that the elongation increased greatly as a function of molecular weight. And this is mainly attributed to the entanglement density increasing as a function of the molecular weight. And so they measure this entanglement molecular weight um, to be 35 kilodaltons, as determined by an increase in the solution viscosity. So above this molecular weight, the polymer chains are entangled. And entanglement is sort of a physical linking of polymer chains. It's a fact, uh, it's a consequence of the fact that polymer chains can slide past one another, but they can't pass through each other. And so they're sort of like knots within the film. And, <coughs> and so this occurs in the amorphous domains of P3HP. Um, so at low molecular weights, the polymer chains behave as short rigid rods and they can easily slip past one another uh, under an applied load. But at high molecular weight, the polymer chains are highly entangled or knotted. Um, in the crystalline regions of P3HP, at low molecular weight, the polymer chains uh, form these chain extended crystals where they can form really closely packed uh, lamellar structures. 
However, at high molecular weight, you can still get some of this lamellar type of behavior, but then you can have one polymer chain that loops upon itself uh, to form a crystal. And then the same polymer chain can go on to become part of multiple crystals. And so they call these polymer chains high molecules. Um, and so overall, high molecules in the crystalline regions and entanglements in the amorphous domains serve to improve the overall connectivity in, in polymer films as a function of their molecular weight. <coughs> And so we compared the stress strain behavior of these of four different molecular weights of PTHT that were carefully selected. And so we selected 15 kilodaltons because it's below the entanglement molecular weight for PTHT. Uh, 40 is right around, and 53 and 80 are much higher. And so both methods capture the same sort of qualitative behavior in that um, they both show an increase in the elongation as a function of their molecular weight. So here, seen here as well. They both capture that 15 kilodalton PTHT is the most brittle sample. And so it has this brittle behavior where it accommodates stress elastically, but then, um, uh, but then fails before any plastic deformation can occur. However, they did differ slightly in their tensile modulus. So these slopes of these lines you notice are different. So in the film on water technique, we see that the 15 kilodalton sample has a low tensile modulus. Um, and then upon surpassing the entanglement molecular weight, we get sort of a spike or a small jump in the tensile modulus, after which point it saturates. In the film on water, or the film on elastomer techniques, we see the same jump in the elastic modulus, um, right around the entanglement molecular weight, but then we see that it decreases um, afterwards. The, you also notice that the magnitude of the tensile modulus is, is quite different. So for example, for 40 kilodalton PTHT, we see that it has an elastic modulus of around 0.27 gigapascals, but for in the film on elastomer technique, we measured 1.7 gigapascals. So an order of magnitude difference between these two techniques. And we hypothesized that the main contributor to these differences is the mode of loading. And so in film on water technique, the films are under tension because they're being pulled apart. Um, but in the film on elastomer technique, you're compressing the films by releasing the pre-strain. And so this type of behavior has been shown before. Um, it should be labeled as a compressive modulus, but since its inception, it's been labeled, it's been called the tensile modulus. So that's how it's known in literature, so that's how I displayed it here. But, but to be precise about it, yes, it is a compressive modulus. But everybody, it, almost every use of this method refers to it as the tensile modulus. Yes. Interstitial uh, stress, residual stress, and so on. But it's not a bad sample. No, it's not. You're correct. And but, but for thin films, there's not a lot of techniques that we can use to measure the tensile modulus in the in the first place. Right. So until, until this method was invented. Yeah. Another quick side example. So this difference is not like any longer specifically for tension and elastic. Okay. So you have to use the auto language of that. Mm-hmm. I was going to elaborate a little bit more on the coming slide. Um, <coughs> so this sort of behavior has been shown before um, in PDMS samples, for example. And so when PDMS is measured in tension, they measure an elastic modulus of 1.32 megapascals. But when it measured in compression, they measured a compressive modulus of 187 megapascals, so two orders of magnitude higher. And there's three reasons that we believe there might be differences in tension and compression, specifically as it pertains to uh, film on water and film on elastomer methods. First has to do with free volume. Yes. 
Yes, this is the uh, Silgard 184 CMS here at 10 to 1 ratio. At least in, as measured in this work, at 25 C. Um, these are thick bulk films, so millimeters thick, um, centimeters long. Yeah, CMS elastomer. At least as shown in this work. I haven't done these measurements myself, but. But from the literature, I've met, this is what they've measured. And they measured that consistently for different samples, even as a function of their temperature. Um, OK. And it's not an order of the magnitude higher. Yeah, yeah two orders of magnitude higher. One order of magnitude higher in our test. Um, so uh, one of the reasons these tests might vary um, has to do with free volume in the polymer films, which arise from void space between neighboring polymer chains, or it could be regions of low density of polymer chains within the film. And so under tension in a freestanding film, these voids will grow and elongate and could lead to uh, a lower tensile modulus or premature failure. In compression tests that um, are supported by elastomers, these voids and pinholes will actually close and could lead to measuring a, a stiffer film. Additionally, surface roughness can play a large role, especially in thin films. And this is because the percentage of the surface roughness can actually be a large percentage of the total film thickness. And so we use atomic force microscopy to measure the peak to valley roughness um, in these materials as a function of their molecular weight. And we found that the peak to valley roughness can actually be 13 to 17 percent of the total film thickness, which is on the order of 200 nanometers. And so if we remember our definition of stress, thinner regions of the polymer film will actually concentrate stress to these regions. And so in, in for a polymer film that's in tension, floated on water surface and freestanding, this can cause stress concentration and premature failure in these regions and results in measuring a lower tensile modulus. However, for film on elastomer techniques where the films are supported by elastomers um, and they're in compression, these peaks and valleys will close um, and there will either will be no effect or there'll be some sort of stiffening effect um, due to the fact that it's supported by the elastomer. Um, there have been density measurements as a function. Um, there have been density measurements, um, but I don't know the values off the top of my head. But I do know that the, the density does decrease as a function of the molecular weight. And that's to do, that has to do with the, as when you cast these films from solution, longer polymer chains have slower reptation dynamics, and so they, when they solidify, they don't have as much time to or they take longer time to rearrange themselves, and so this results in a more porous or more free volume within the polymer network. No, these are, they're not exactly rubbers. The, the, I'm talking right now about the P2HT films, which don't behave exactly like rubbers. They have glassy regions and, and crystalline regions, so they're not exactly behaving like a rubber. Yes. Um, and so the third effect comes from the viscoelastic behavior of polymeric materials, which means they have a, both viscous and elastic behavior. Uh, which means that they have time-dependent mechanical behavior depending on how fast you strain them. And so prior studies have shown this beha behavior. And so here's an example of high-density polyethylene that was strained um, at an increasing strain rate. And you see a shifting of this curve into the top left, which means they're measuring a higher tensile modulus as a function of the strain rate. Um, and also you can get lower strains at, at failure. And so we did a similar test using the film on water technique where we showed that um, the similar type of behavior. So we chose a slow strain rate of 0.3 millimeters per second and a fast strain rate of 3 millimeters per second and showed that this doubles the elastic modulus that we measure and it lowers the strain at failure. And so this has to do with the polymer chain re uh, rearrangement. So uh, at slow strain rates, the polymer chains can rearrange in response to the stress. Um, but at some faster strain rates, you don't give the polymer chains enough time. So 
we, we observed this sort of behavior for film on water techniques. And I did a similar test using film on elastin techniques where I laminated thin films to do PDMS and then I released the strain rate at two different rates. One was at a slow strain rate of 0.3 millimeters per second. The other was at a fast strain rate um, where I just released the strain instantaneously. And I found no difference in the buffering wavelength um, between these two strain rates, which to me sh showed that there's no strain rate dependence, um, at least for film on elastomer techniques. And this is mainly due to the fact that the, the fills are supported by, by a substrate. And so we believe this is the main contributor to the differences within our techniques. Um, <coughs> So that was for the differences in the elastic modulus. As far as the differences in the strain at failure or the crack onset strain, we see that both methods capture the same behavior or the qualitative behavior in that we get increases in the strain at failure as a function of the molecular weight and increases in the crack onset strain as a function of the molecular weight. However, the order or the magnitude is a little bit different. So in the 80 kilodalton sample, we see it can be strained up to 100%. However, for the, for the film on elastomer technique, it can only be strained up to 30%. So this has to do with the labeling of the failure events. So in the film on water technique or in the tensile test, the strain at failure is the failure point at which, or it's the point at which the film completely rips in half or bifurcates as shown here. But for film on Alaska methods, it's the onset of these cracks or pinholes. And so here's an example of a P3HD film strained at 10%, strained at 20%, and then strained at 30%. And for these three examples here, we would say that the crack onset strain occurs at 20%. And so we label the onset of cracks as the failure point because for films on elastomers, the elastomer can actually redistribute the stress away from the film. And so this can lead to artificially high values of the strain at failure. So if we were to strain this film until these cracks completely propagated through the film, they would be artificially high and might even be higher than the strains at failure for a freestanding film. And so we label the crack onset strain instead. And so that is actually No, I'm saying that if we were to keep stretching this film until we see a complete bifurcation of the film, that would give us an artificially high value of the strain at failure. Than this one, yeah. Because it's the stress is being redistributed away from the film. And so instead, we label the onset of the pinholes or cracks within the film, which is why that it's, it's much lower. Yes, I have. And sometimes the, the, the PDMS strip will, will snap in half before the film actually will. So it, it, it they can go up to lengths of 100, 110%, um, which is past the elastic limit for 10 to 1 PDMS, for example. Um, and so typically we label the onset of pinholes. Um, in this work, we hypothesized two different modes of fracture. Um, so at low molecular weight, we hypothesized that chain pullout is the dominant mechanism of failure. And, that, and this is due to the fact that polymer chains are short rigid rods and they can easily slide past one another. But at high molecular weight, the polymer films are highly entangled, and so the stress gets concentrated to relatively fewer chains. Um, in addition, the energy required for chain pullout is much higher, and so chain scission could be the dominant mechanism of failure. And so to provide evidence for these results, uh, or for these hypotheses, we perform coarse grained molecular dynamic simulations. My collaborator, um, Dr. Sam Root, performed these simulations. And so he performed simulations of two different systems. One of 50 MERS, which is around the entanglement molecular weight, or slightly below a P3HD. And one for much higher molecular weight um, for P3HD, which is much past the entanglement molecular weight. And so in these simulations, you can see that down here is the low molecular weight simulation. And we see this initial spike in the stress response and then a relaxation back down to zero. And then within the simulation box itself, we can see that the polymer chains are physically being pulled apart which supports the hypothesis that at low molecular weight, the dominant mechanism of failure is chain pullout. Um, I also need to note that in these simulations, the polymer chains weren't allowed to break. So at higher molecular weight, we perform the same simulation, and we see the same stress response, but then it never relaxes back down to zero. Um, and since the polymer chains weren't allowed to break within the simulation, um, and we don't see chain pullout at up to, chain, at up to 200%, even though we know that experimentally these films should have failed by now, we can infer from these results that the dominant mechanism of failure at high molecular weight might be chain scission. <coughs> and so thus far I've been talking about mechanical properties like elastic modulus and the strains at failure. 
Uh, but there's other types of mechanical properties you can measure, such as, for example, cohesion and adhesion. Um, you can think of cohesion as like the resistance to tearing um, in a film, and adhesion is the resistance to delamination away from the substrate. And so um, in this work, I use scratch tests to characterize these types of behavior. And so cohesion is, high values of cohesion are important in organic semiconductors because um, high values of, these form of cohesion can hinder the initiation and propagation of cracks within these films. Also, organic semiconducting devices are typically fabricated as in multiple layers. So for example, a solar cell has up to four to five layers. And so adhesion between these layers is important for the overall uh, stability, mechanical stability of these devices. And so in this study that was done in our group um, in collaboration with uh, Fre Professor Frederick Krebs and Nikki Finn, who's a graduate student in our lab, and what they show is that um, Professor Frederick Krebs provided these rollable -roll printed solar cells, and we subjected them to stress tests. And so we stress test them by bending them thousands of times or twisting them thousands of times, and analyzed the dominant mechanism of failure. And what we found was that, or what they found is that the dominant mechanism of failure was delamination at the interfaces, as well as just complete ripping of the solar cell devices um, in half in some cases. And so high values of cohesion and adhesion can actually help prevent this sort of behavior. So I use a technique called scratch testing where <coughs> for the first time to characterize this sort of behavior in thin film um, polymer, polymeric materials. And so how a scratch test works is that you use a hard indented tip, um, typically made of diamond, to impress into a thin film uh, with a force that increases linearly with position. And so here's an image of a real scratch panel. And so when you scratch into the film, you can observe cohesive failure as tearing or cracking in the film you can observe adhesive failure as delamination of the film away from the substrate, as shown here. And so the locations of these critical are, there's typically three critical locations that are labeled within these tests. Um, and the force measured at these locations is related um, to either the cohesive failure or the adhesive failure. And so for example, LC1 is related to the normal force at this position, it was called FN1. LC2 is related to FN2, um, and, and so on. So there's a number of parameters that can affect the locations of these failure events. So for example, your rate of loading can affect these locations. The modulus of your stylus tip can affect these locations. The thickness of the films can affect these locations. Um, but if you control for these parameters across all of your samples, you can use FN1, FN2, and FN3 as a comparative analysis of your materials. And so I perform these tests um, as a function of the side chain length in poly 3 alkylthiophene and as a function of the molecular weight um, in P3HT, which is for N equals 6. <coughs> no, I'm going I'm to explain right here in this slide. Um, so cohesive failure, again, can be seen as cracking or tearing in the film. Um, and adhesive failure is delamination of the film away from the substrate. So if we take the same film that I showed previously, um, critical location one is the point in the film where the stylus first tears the surface of the film. Um, so it's torn through, this, through the thickness of the film, but act, hasn't actually touched the substrate yet. And so the region to the left of LC1 in this case is due to plastic deformation and not actually due to tearing. If we look at this close-up image here, I labeled the onset of tearing in the film as a change in the optical behavior. So to the left of LC1, we see this gray dull behavior, but to the right, we see this bright orange. Um, and so I labeled this point here as the onset of tearing, uh, or critical location one. Um, and the force measured at this location, Fn1, can be used to compare the, the cohesive strength of materials. So LC2, which is critical location two, is where the stylus completely penetrates through the thickness of the film and actually touches the substrate. And this signals the onset of adhesive failure in these tests. And LC3, which is critical location three, is the onset of gross delamination, or the point at which the films completely tear away from the surface. And so together, LC2 and LC3 are used as a measure of the adhesive strength of materials. So I perform these tests first as a function of the length of the side chain um, and P poly 3 alkylthiophene. And I chose these three data points specifically because they're around the glass transition temperatures for P3HD. And so what I observed or what I measured was that there's a decrease in the force measured at LC1 as a function of side chain length. So you can see that here plotted quantitatively, but you can also observe that here qualitatively by, by um, noticing that the initiation of LC1 moves further to the left. And since the force um, increases linearly with position, 
lo critical locations that are further to the left and require a lower force. And so we see a decrease in the cohesive strength of these materials as a function of side chain length. And we also see a decrease in their adhesive behavior as a function of their side chain length. So the initiation of LC2 moves further to the left. Um, for FN3, which is the onset of growth delamination, we don't see a similar trend. And we see a large amount of error in these measurements, and the error bars actually overlap. Um, which means that we can't really point to any trend. Um, and this comes, or this is a fact or a consequence of the difficulty in the labeling of the onset of growth delamination for n equals 7 and 10. So for n equals 6, I would clearly label growth delamination as beginning here. But for n equals 7, it's difficult to determine if I should label it here or here or here. Same thing for n equals 10. Um, however, upon visual inspection, I would still say that films of n equals 6 are, have more adhesive strength than n equals 7 and n equals 10. So the reason that we observe, that we might observe or measure this decrease in cohesive strength for P3A2 is due to their glass transition temperature. Um, and so for glass, for P3A2s of N equals 6, they have a glass room temperature or glass transition temperature that is right around or slightly below or above room temperature. But for N equals 7 and above, the glass transition, the TG of these materials are above room temperature. And so the TG is a measure of the mobility of the polymer chain so for example, for a material for like N equals 7 that has a TG below room temp, at room temperature, the film is in its liquid-like state, meaning that the polymer chains have more thermal motion and they can more easily rearrange and respond to a, a stress. However, below or above the glass transition temperature, they're in their glassy-like state, and meaning that they're more stiff, less thermal motion, and tend to have brittle-like behavior. And so this was shown as a function of side chain length that the tensile modulus decreases. Um, mainly due to this transition in the glass, uh, glass transition temperature. And so this could lead to lower values of cohesion that we observe as a function of side chain length. Um, in addition, the same study by Dr. Savagatrip showed that there's an increase in the water contact angle as a function of side chain length, um, which means that there's a decrease in the surface energy as a function of side chain length. And typically, decreases in surface energy are correlated with lower values of adhesion, <coughs> which is my which is the reason we might observe this decreased adhesion as a function of side chain length. In addition, I need to mention that there is some cooperativity um, between cohesive failure and adhesive failure in scratch tests. So for example, for the film to fail adhesively, it has to first fail cohesively, meaning that the stylus actually has to penetrate through the thickness of the film and onset um, delamination. And so in part, it could be due, or this decrease in adhesion could be due to decreased cohesion uh, in these materials. So we also measured the cohesion and adhesion as a function of side chain or a molecular weight for n equals six, which is P3H2. And if you remember, these are the same molecular weights that were chosen for the previous comparison study. And again, that's due to 15 kilodaltons P3H2 be being below the entanglement molecular weight, 40 being right around, and 63 and 80 being much above. And so when we measured the force required for cohesive failure, we found an increase, or the opposite trend, as a function of the molecular weight. Um, and the greatest increase comes after you're much, much higher than the entanglement molecular weight. And so the cohesion of, the cohesion increases as a function of molecular weight due to the entanglement density increasing as well. So again, this was entanglements in the amorphous domains and tie molecules in the crystalline domains that just overall improved the connectivity within the polymer film and raised the energy required for these chains to slip past one another, which improved their cohesive strength. Uh, we also observed similar results for the onset of the adhesive failure and the onset of gross delamination. And again, the largest jumps come after we're much, much higher than the entanglement um, molecular weight of these materials. And so the observed increase in the adhesion could be due to the cooperativity and the increase in the cohesion, but we hypothesize another effect which comes from uh, the thickness of the skin layer within these materials. And so any polymeric material will have a skin layer on either free surface of the polymer film. And this is, uh, the skin layer is a layer in which the polymer chains are loosely bound or they're, they have a less, they're less uh, entangled than those chains that are in the bulk. And so this, the, the properties of the skin layer can actually be different than those in the bulk. So for example, it can have a lower glass transition temperature or it can have a lower elastic modulus. Um, and again, that's due to the fact that these chains are, are loosely, loosely entangled or loosely bound they have fewer nearest neighbors than those chains that are in the bulk. Um, 
And so under an applied stress, they can more easily respond or plastically deform or rearrange themselves. Um, and so my collaborator, Sam Root, performed coarse grain molecular dynamic simulations again, where we showed that for a 40 nanometer thin film, the density of entanglements is initially low. And as you penetrate 10 nanometers into the film, you get a spike in the entanglement density, which is a quarter, way, quarter of the way into the film. <coughs> and so the thickness of the skin layer can actually increase as a function of molecular weight. And that's due to the fact that the radius of gyration and the average end-to-end -end distance of the polymers also increases as a function of molecular weight. And so we measured or we estimated that for a low molecular weight film, the total thickness of the skin layer can be 10% of the total film thickness. And that at higher molecular weights, it can actually be 30% of the total film thickness. And so a greater volume of the skin layer will have a greater ability to dissipate mechanical stress um, by plastic deformation of the polymer chain, say, in front of the side of the ship. Um, and this will lead to, this could lead to bigger or greater values of cohesion and adhesion. So when we plot these forces um, for cohesion and adhesion as a function of the degree of polymerization, for all polymers that are above their entanglement molecular weight, we see we measured a linear correlation. And so we chose the degree of polymerization as opposed to the molecular weight um, because increases in the side chain length will actually increase your molecular weight without increasing your degree of polymerization or the length of your polymer. And so we plotted these forces for FN1 and FN2 which are again measures of cohesion and adhesion versus their degree of polymerization, we found a linear correlation in both, um, in for both quantities, um, which says, or which points to the result that at least in P3HEs, the length of the polymer chain is more important than the side chain length, um, and then the side chain length. And that one strategy for improving both cohesion and adhesion in these materials could be to simply increase the degree of polymerization in your material. And so this was that, that pretty much uh, sums up my thesis work. I wanted to briefly mention some ongoing projects that were not included in my thesis. And so this first work is uh, we used P.PSS, which is a conductive polymer, to create these wearable electrotactile devices. Now electrotactiles work by um, inducing small electrical currents or applying small electrical currents to the surface of the skin, which excite the mechanoreceptors within the skin and lead to a sensation or the feeling of the sensation. And so, um, because we chose PDMS, which is a water-soluble conductive polymer, uh, we can process it in, in, in easy ways that can be used to fabricate these tattoo-like devices. So here, we laminated or we deposited P PDMS by printing these materials onto tattoo paper and then laminating that paper onto the skin. We see, we see that um, the P.PSS makes this really close and formal contact with the skin. Um, and creates these really cool or these really skin conformal um, haptic feedback devices. Um, in addition, we also fabricated uh, multimodal haptic feedback devices. So here we have electrotactile pixels that are laminated on the top of PDMS, but underneath the PDMS there's these superimposed microfluidic channels. And so uh, this offers us a different mode of, of, of haptic feedback by or sending air through this channel, we can apply a force, a small force to the surface of the skin. And so each of these pixels has this capability. So we can both apply a small force using compressed air and a small electrical current um, using a voltage. And so all in total, between each of these pixels, we can create 256 unique combinations by having each one of these modes either on or off. Um, and so we also measure the mechanical properties of our PDOT materials to ensure, especially for skin wearable electronics, the elastic modulus um, plays a large role. So the closer that the elastic modulus of the materials matches that of the skin, the more imperceptible the materials will be to the user. Um, in addition, we also need the, these materials to withstand biological strain that are caused by twisting and bending of, of skin. And so we characterize the performance of, our, of these materials by creating what we call these sensation curves where we, at a specific frequency, we test the voltage needed to induce a sensation. And so any voltage below these curves means that we can't fill the device, and voltages above these, um, these curves mean that we can fill the device. So for example, for this P.DOT dough material here, at 10 hertz, below 10 volts, we cannot fill a sensation, but above 10 volts, we can fill the sensation. And we compare this to gold, which is, you know, is a, is a metallic semiconductor, or it's a metallic conductor, that has really low, uh, really high uh, 
uh, connectivity. And so we compared our results, our materials to gold, and we found that they are in the same order of magnitude as gold. And in, in some cases, they're even better than gold at inducing these sensations, in addition to being stretchable and conformable to skin. And so this is ongoing work. And the next project I want to talk about is a, a collaboration with uh, Julian Ramirez, uh, who's a grad student in our lab right now, where we fabricated uh, graphene nano island and TDOT composite sensors, um, wearable sensors for monitoring sleep apnea. Now, sleep apnea is a condition where uh, a patient in their sleep has difficulty or maybe even stop breathing um, for, uh, for 30 seconds up to past one minute. And so we use these materials called graphene. Uh, or prior in our, previously in our lab, we developed these materials called graphene nano islands, uh, where you deposit, when you deposit small amounts of metal onto a graphene substrate, they form these metallic nano islands that are, have these small separation distances. And upon bending or flexing or stretching these materials, the separation distances between these uh, nano islands increases. This leads to an increase in the resistance and they make really sensitive strain sensors. Um, so we wanted to use these materials. So these materials um, or graphene nano islands make really sensitive strain sensors, but they can't really be stretched that far. Um, so we wanted to use T.PSS, which is again is this conductive polymer, to laminate or to fill in the gaps um, between the nano islands. And so this our hypothesis was that um, TDMS or T.PSS can improve the stretchability of these devices and provide some sort of durability to the graphene nano islands, while also providing a different pathway for the electrons to take under larger strains. So for example, at small, small strains, the electrons would go primarily through the graphene nano island substrate. Um, but at larger strains, when the separation distances between the nano islands are too great, the electrons would travel through the T.PSS instead. And this can make a, a, a wearable sensor that can detect um, both heartbeat um, and breathing in, in a patient. And so we laminated, we fabricated these sensors and laminated them underneath the pectoral muscles um, on the left side of the chest. And we were successfully able to measure both respiration, which, which can be seen as these large deviations here and the resistance, um, and heartbeats, which are these little perturbations um, in the signal there. And so, and here's a zoom close up image of, of, this, of this effect. And so, um, so far we've been able to successfully demonstrate that these materials, or this composite material, can, can both measure respiration and heartbeat. And so ongoing work for this project is going to include um, collecting this data, um, sending this, making this device wireless, so we can send the data through Bluetooth to a phone to, uh, to collect the data um, so that the, we can either give this data to a, to a doctor so that they can further analyze it, or potentially even provide some sort of feedback to the patient if they stop breathing for longer than, say, a minute or so. And this could be in the form of an audible signal coming from a cell phone, or maybe even some form of haptic feedback. <coughs> sure. It's, uh, no, PDOT is conductive. It's conductive polymer. And so, yes, it's all three of these um, materials within this composite are conducting. Yes. The PDOT? Yeah. But, but they could, but the sensitivity, like PDOT, we did controls that I didn't show here, but when we just take a PDOT PSS film by itself and try to detect these same heartbeats and respiration, it doesn't pick it up. So it's not sensitive enough. Um, so we do still need the graphene nano ions for the sensitivity, but the PDOT is playing the role of, of making this device more durable and also providing additional pathways for the electrons to take under larger strains. Because graphene nano ions by themselves wouldn't survive being laminated onto the skin in the first place. So it kind of sort of combines properties from both. Definitely the graphene nano islands. And we have control studies where we did cantilever experiments where we bend each of these materials on their own at small strains. And where we've shown that graphene nano islands can detect small strains up to 0.001% strains. Uh, but PDOT PSS can't by itself. I think that when we use insulating materials, 
it fills the gaps between these these uh, these nano islands, and it leads to a higher resistance and less less sensitivity within the film. And so I do think that we still need a conductive polymer um, to help fill these gaps because it because it's still conductive. When we use insulating polymers, we don't observe the same level of sensitivity, and we also just overall get much much higher resistance values, raw resistance values. Okay, um, in summary, I've shown that isomers can prevent the crystallization and soften blends of PCA2 and fullerene uh, with no loss or little to no loss in their performance. And that this also lowers the embodied, embodied energy in these materials and lowers their cost. Um, I've also shown that side chains improve the compliance of small molecule semi semiconductors, but they can hinder their um, solar cell performance. And that one strategy to co-optimize properties in these small molecule based uh, solar cells is to use additives such as polystyrene or GIO. Um, I've also shown that thermal water tests produce lower tensile modulus values um, than those produced by the film elastomer methods, and this is mainly due to voids and pinholes or defects in the films behaving differently under tension and compression. And that both methods overall capture this increase in the ductility of the films as a function of their molecular weight. And lastly, I've shown that scratch testing is an effective method of measuring cohesion and adhesion in organic semiconductors, and that by increasing the degree of polymerization, at least in PCA2s, um, we can improve both the cohesion and adhesion um, in these materials. And so here's a list of my publications. So this is then before the committee. Um, and here are my acknowledgments. So first I'd like to thank uh, Professor Lapomi for his, uh, for his great mentorship and you know, his friendship over these past years. I credit Darren with with essentially, you know, motivating me and convincing me that I, that I was capable of, of doing this. Um, to my prior mentors, uh, Sutra Sabagachup and Dr. Adam Prince, or Dr. Sabagachup, sorry, sorry Sutra, uh, <laughs> don't mean to demote you like that. These were my prior two mentors when I first joined the group, and they took me under their wing and showed me everything they know, um, as well as Tim, Alex, and Brandon, who were also prior uh, grads when I got into the group, um, Sam, Dr. Sam Root now, uh, Julian, Cody, and Mo were my graduate student, um, I guess you could say partners in crime over the last few years, um, and they contributed heavily to much of my projects. Um, and my undergraduates, um, Eduardo, Andrew, Anne, Madeline, and Armando, who I've worked heavily with over the past few years, um, and have contributed you know, in, a, in a ton of ways to all of my projects. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge and thank my wife, Bree, for her continued support and just unwavering support over these last few years and even beyond that, you know, for the past 10 years or more in anything I do. Um, and also the rest of the Pomi group, I think that our group is just an amazing group of people to, to work with and um, it really made my PhD very enjoyable. So thank you to, to the Pomi group. Um, so thank you for listening and I'll now take your questions. <coughs>